Now, a Q&A special, Trading Places, the last in the current series. We would like to warn viewers that this programme contains strong language. Hello and a warm welcome to Q&A. Tonight, as World Cup fever begins to engulf the nation, we bring you a special programme which gets under the skin of the world of football. It's a tale of two towns, of joy and of despair. Throughout the season, the people of both Halifax and Doncaster have been gripped by football fever, but for very different reasons. As the two clubs' fortunes have taken opposite directions and they have traded places in football's pecking order. Our story begins in Halifax five years ago. Might look to nick this one in and it's chested down towards Hall. Robotham, Anderson, Robotham again, it's coming across the hall. And Derek Hall, a former Halifax Town player, scores the goal that could send his team out of the league. I remember the ball getting crossed in and I just happened to find myself in the penalty area and it came to me and I, I didn't actually hit it that hard whether that was in my mind or not I don't know and it, next thing I knew I hit the back of the net and it seemed a, like a deathly silence in the ground and some of my players came up to congratulate me and that's when it hit me then I actually felt drained at that time that I'd perhaps scored the goal that would send Halifax out of the league there was something I had to do I couldn't miss on purpose and, but at the end of the day I felt very drained and probably suffered as much as the Halifax people that day They've still got to retain their composure while really throwing everything forward in the search for an equaliser. Patterson, and now surely Hardy! Well, you've got to feel sorry there for Jamie Patterson. He's played really well today, and I know there are some Football League scouts here who feel that they might pick up one or two bargains at the end of the season if Halifax do go out of the league. He is certainly one of them. To actually get relegated is bad enough, but to go out of the Football League, um, I mean, it's massive, and I felt you know, solely responsible for it. It's all over. After 72 years, Halifax Town have lost their place in the Football League. The fans come on, but a goal by a former Halifax player, Derek Hall, has sent Halifax out of the league and maybe out of business altogether. we just won the game with Hereford, that was the last thought in my mind. My thought was to, perhaps I was going to have to live with this, the, the, the person that had scored the goal that sent Halifax out of the league. Um, at the time it was very emotional. I felt it that day like the people of Halifax felt it. It was a horrible day all round. Um, it had been building up for a long time. The feeling around the whole, the whole town was, it was just a horrible feeling. Um, and one that we never really want to experience again. It was probably one of the worst days of my life, along with maybe 7,000 people out there. They were all tears shed, there were bits of turf getting dug up, and it was like administering the last rites. But Halifax did pick themselves up from that massive blow and play on in the GM Vauxhall Conference. Four years later, though, they were on the brink of a far worse crisis, dropping down into an even lower league. With two games to go, Halifax were losing against Macclesfield Town, the conference leaders, on their way into the Football League. But a fight back from 3-1 down to earn a point was to prove crucial. The task to get out of the conference, basically, uh, we totally underestimated 
um, the commitment of teams in the conference and the standard of football in the conference. We thought it was just a matter of we'll maintain the professional standards and we'll be up again the following year. Uh, nothing could have been further from the truth. On the very last day of that 1996-97 season, Halifax had to beat Steve Nishbera or face the unthinkable, a drop into the Unibond League. Former boss from the 70s, George Mulhall, had taken over as joint manager to ride the storm. It looked as if they had, if they had got a goal and got a draw, we were down. And we eventually scored in the last minute to make it 4-2, which it didn't matter then, we were definitely safe then. And there was a crowd invasion before the referee had blown the final whistle. So I think they thought the game was over. So yeah, I think the tears, the tears were in my eyes. It had been another amazing fight back. Halifax Town was safe for another year. But the manager took no part in the celebrations. He knew there was work to be done. We weren't playing very good football. We were conceding a lot of goals and obviously losing a lot of games. It was bad. It was really bad. In the Doncaster Rovers dressing room, things were even worse. To become a laughing stock, whether you like each other or not, is immaterial. There's plenty of good businesses got together with two people who didn't like each other, but they got the rest together. In the past, Rovers had struggled financially, but they'd always managed to keep their heads above water. The arrival of Ken Richardson as the new chairman in March 1993 was to prove a watershed. His story was literally one of rags to riches. In his hometown of Driffield, the multi-millionaire was known as Rag Tag Ritchie. It said he made a million pounds on backing horses. The rest of his fortune was based on the manufacture of paper sacks. Some fans wondered whether his arrival at Bellevue was good news. Others believed that better times were around the corner. The majority of the fans were euphoric because for many years Doncaster had been struggling. Uh, the taxman had been at them, the batman had been there. They were having poor season after poor season and we were just lucky to finish mid-table. And along came this saviour in the form of Ken Richardson who was going to pay off all the debts, bringing a load of players for us and we were on our way to the first division, if not higher. The previous hierarchy for the past 15 years have totally alienated the club from the ordinary townspeople, supporters and business people, and there's been no communication. Rover's only asset, apart from the players, was the remaining 66 years of a 99-year lease on its ground at Bellevue. It's obviously a lucrative site, which could fetch its owners, Doncaster Council, millions of pounds if redeveloped. But fans were concerned when this appeared in the national broadsheets. We were rather uh, taken back because um, Mr Richardson advertised our land for sale in the Financial Times and indeed in the uh, Telegraph uh, without any kind of prior discussions with the councillors. So we took a rather uh, dim view of that, as you can imagine. Um, so that didn't help relationships between the parties. Links between the chairman and the council deteriorated. In June 1995, the main stand at Bellevue was minutes from being destroyed by fire. The fans were surprised when their chairman was charged with conspiracy to commit arson. He's due to stand trial in January at Sheffield Crown Court. But on the pitch, the news was better. Under manager Sammy Chung, it seemed Rovers did have a side capable of going places. Sammy had done a good job for us. I mean, with, until about the last six or eight weeks of this, the previous season, we've been challenging for promotion. But the start of the 96-97 season, we were in the sponsors' lounge before the game. We'd spoken to Sammy Chung before two o'clock and Sammy Chung was at that time the manager of Doncaster Rovers and about half an hour before kickoff, Ken Richardson came into the sponsors lounge and announced to us that he'd dismissed Sammy Chung and that we'd got Kerry Dixon as the player manager. Uh, we, were, we were aghast, we, we didn't know what was going on because to, to fire your manager half an hour or an hour before the new football league season kicks off, uh, it's a pretty unheard of thing. There's your granddad's football. Team there. Yeah, well, There's your granddad there. 
Well, it, it would look a bit like him, darling, wouldn't it? Yeah. And the father played for Doncaster Rovers just after the war. He loved the club as much as I do. Doncaster Rovers versus Werder Bremen in 1969. And German World Cup players in that side, and we could beat them in those days. I remember going about seven years ago with him, and Rovers had a gate of about 2,600, and he turned to me and said, when I played, we used to get more here for the reserve games. And it just shows that over the years that the club has gone backwards. Under Kerry Dixon, Doncaster Rovers struggled. They spent most of his first season flirting with relegation, but eventually managed to pull themselves clear. However, the Omens were not looking good last summer. With debts totalling over a million pounds, the administrators were called into Bellevue. In the build-up to their new season, Halifax played their neighbours Huddersfield Town and won. The performance left the manager, the team captain and the supporters full of hope. Captain Peter Jackson was to make his mark both on the field and behind the scenes. I thought, you know, I started pre-season then that there were good team spirit and the lads and I thought it was really important that the club started well and we played Huddersfield in a pre-season friendly and beat them 2-1 and played really well and I thought after that result that we had a great chance of uh, being champions that year. I think some of our supporters thought the same because the betting was 66 to 1 and after that Huddersfield game the betting went to 51 overnight so I think a few of the supporters thought the same. I obviously didn't think what was going to happen that's happened but I thought we'd do a lot better than we did last year. By late September the optimism appeared justified. League Town were the next visitors, Halifax were unbeaten in the conference, the supporters were coming back and the money was certainly coming in. The results continued to go Halifax Town's way. <laughs> 2 1 on the night, Halifax went to the top of the conference table. Amidst all of this, Peter Jackson remained a key and influential part of a momentum which was to carry the whole town with it. I said, uh, as soon as Halifax hit the top of the league, I'm going to put the flag out. We've been a lifelong supporter. You know, it's not happening so often. I thought, right, the flag's going out as soon as we're top of the league. The only regret I have, I didn't put money on them this time. They were 66 to 1 to go up and I never put anything on them. I've seen a field this field in their pre-season friendly and that got me going, oh, so good then. So I've got a £10 one there for a straight win and a £5 each way. So if we, if we finish off, I've got £1,100 to come there. But with confidence at a peak, Peter Jackson accepted a better offer to become manager of Huddersfield Town. His departure could have blown apart the Halifax dream. I had it written in the contract with, with the chairman and George there, uh, that if a club came in for me in a coaching or manager in general capacity, they'd let me go. So, uh, you know, it could have been it could have been after three games, but uh, it was after ten games. Well, I knew that he was a big influence, and uh, he kept the back four solid, or the back three solid, and I felt we needed somebody with character to continue in that position. And uh, I mean, the story is well known now that I got a phone call from a plumber. He mentioned Brian Klein, and my answer was, "I don't. You don't mean the Brian Klein that played at Wembley with Coventry?" He says, "Yeah, the same man." So I got his phone number and rang him up, and he came in and trained with us. It was in 1987 that Brian Kilkline lifted the FA Cup for Coventry. In 1997, Killer came out of retirement to play for Halifax. Well done, lad. With Kilkline, the winning streak continued. It appeared a crisis had been averted. <laughs>